Our third speaker of the program, Dr. Um, Robert Hobbs specializes in 20th and 21st century art. He is the author of more than 20 books, including monographs on Milton Avery, Edward Hopper, Robert, Mother, Robert Motherwell, Lee Krasner, Robert Smithson, and Kara Walker, as well as Andreas um, Sereno, Kelly Walker, and Kleiss Wiley. In 2008, Dr. Hobbs contributed an essay on Yinka Shanabare, The Politics of Re Representation, MBE, to the exhibition catalog Yinka Shinabare MBA. MBE, sorry. He curated exhibitions, um, his, his curated exhibitions have been shown at such venues as the Va Venice Biennale, the Whitney Museum of Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Without further ado, Dr. Robert Harbs. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I have to say I was at the, this museum about a year after it was built, and seeing it now, it's aging beautifully. It is such a gorgeous structure, and I'm pretty bowled over with it. I also feel that I'm personally responsible for bringing the rain, so when you <laughs> applaud at the end of my paper, be sure to note that one also. Years ago, I used to go to the rain dances of the Hopi uh, for the Niman Kachina dance, and perhaps some of you have gone, and one of the things that was so wonderful is it rained every single time. And the other thing is you'd see the gathering of the clan and, you know, the older citizens. And when it poured down rain, it was marvelous because they just sat there and enjoyed it. It was really terrific. I have to say that my interactions with the staff of the De Young before coming here have been absolutely extraordinary. And I want to single out the people with whom I've corresponded or talked. Jill Dallas D'Alessandro has been fabulous. Her assistant, who I understand is still relatively new to the de Young, Kristen Stewart, has been marvelous. And Gregory Stock has been extraordinarily patient. I still don't have in my, what is it, the something nine form, anyway. To, <laughs> but I, I promise to do it after this. Uh, let me say something before I actually begin. And that is, you see Yinka Shonabari's name, and you see the initials after it, M-B-E. He has taken that on as part of his legal name, it's sort of like in, it's sort of like in Germany if you have a PhD, it's part of your legal name, not in the US. But uh, it's a member of British Empire, and so uh, it's a very important part of his work. So let me begin. Most critics and scholars have looked at distinct genres of Rinka Shonabari's work, this London-based Nigerian expatriate, rather than considering his, oh, how his overall art builds on such larger aesthetic issues as excess and beauty, and such broad-based political concerns as imperialism, post-colonialism, and globalism. And I'm defining globalism in relationship to hybridity. I'm seeing globalism as uh, the movement of information across permeable boundaries. A very good example of globalism in this country is 9-11. We suddenly realized our boundaries were not sacrosanct. And this globalism results in occasions of hybridity in terms of multiple subject positions or multiple ethnicities Hybridity is Shonabari's, and if you look at the, if I did this properly, uh, the quotation here, he says, although I speak Yoruba very well, I think in English sometimes, and it's rather strange, you know, you move from one way of thinking, then you think in Yoruba. Sometimes you think in English, and you dream in English sometimes. It's that kind of existence that in a way my work tries to talk about. My work is actually not about the representation of politics, but the politics of representation. And so I think this hybridity mini symposium today is really about the politics of representation. Schonenbar's work is notable not only for those high art and popular cultural elements that it privileges, but also for the aspects of the artist Yoruba background that it reconsiders from a global point of view. 
Most of Shonabari's art since 1992 incorporates African print fabrics, and I'm going to be talking about them today, in paintings, sculptures, installations, and photographs, making it crucial for appreciation of the complex and at times little understood background of the hybrid material that affects the way it is read. African print fabric has been as important to Shonabari's art as automotive parts have been to the sculpture of American artist John Chamberlain. The meaning of African print fabric in Shonabari's work is in part predicated on global history, the process by which it is manufactured and merchandised, and the way it has been traditionally used in Africa, as well as in, as more recently, this is Mugabe, I think it's so ironic that when he was re-elected, what did he do? He appeared in a suit, bright yellow suit, I tried to get the slide of it, wearing African print fabric. And as you'll see, it really is an image of imperialism, European imperialism, and hybridity, as well as in the UK and US, where it has become a sign of Afrocentrism. Before looking at this product's history, a brief review of the names used for this material helps in part to explain why its references to authenticity and place of manufacture have proven such a rich resource for Shonabari. Standard names generally used for this fabric are the ones employed by the South Holland manufacturer, that is the Netherlands manufacturer, Blisco Company which is the producer of the finest African print textiles since 1846 and fabrics that Shonabari utilizes for his work. These names are Super Wax, which Blisco inaugurated in 1973, and Real Dutch Wax, or Veritable Wax Hollandaise, Blisco, for French-speaking Africans, which this company introduced in 1980. In addition to the next slide, in addition to brand names, such generic references as industrial batik and African print fabric, print fabric are commonly used. The history of the distribution of European and southeastern printed cottons in sub-Saharan West and Central Africa is at best sketchy. According to Kevin Matthews of the UCLA African Studies Center, quote, European and Indian produced textiles served as exchange currency in the gold, ivory, and slave trades, quotes closed. The distribution of these fabrics began in the late 16th century when the Portuguese sold Indian cotton textiles Later in the 19th century, French merchants exported guinea cloth to this region. In order to compete with Indian fabrics, particularly calicos from Calcutta, which were often traded for African slaves, European manufacturers began re working, and in their minds, they thought they were improving, let's put that one in quotes, on the designs commonly used for Yoruba resist dyed textiles and other regional fabrics. When the Dutch recruited West African mercenaries from 1837 to 1872 to help take back Indonesia, several generations of these soldiers returned home with Eastern batiks, which were already known in the West, in West Africa through trade. An often told, but it's only a partially correct story, is that Dutch manufacturers be began producing in the 19th century copies of Indonesian batiks, which failed to meet the high standards set by Indonesian producers and thus were pawned off on the far less discerning sub-Saharan West and Central African buyers. This is not true. They weren't pawning off bad goods at all. But the narrative, this narrative is inconsistent, and I checked with the people at Belisco and found, of course, they're going to say the best thing possible, but it was a way of looking at this, since they're tops in the field, uh, a very different history. According to Belisco, which was known as P.F. Blissing, Blissingen, I can hardly say it, Blissingen 
and Company, that's the reason they changed it to Valisco, before 1964, completely hand-printed textiles were produced until circa 1910 to 11, when the company introduced its first wax printing machines. Belisco had begun exporting its completely hand-printed wax boutiques to the Dutch East Indies in 1852, and only started introducing its designs in Africa in 1876. Problems with the Dutch East Indian market began in 1900 when Indonesians developed stamps, which lowered production companies. They, had, they could stamp the fabric, the designs. And also when the Indonesian Dutch government protected local productions by imposing stiff tariffs, thus forcing Vlisco and other Dutch companies to develop markets elsewhere, including Africa, which became Vlisco's major focus. In 1932, the director of Lisco visited West Africa and discovered ways his products could appeal even more to local preferences, with the result that the company was ultimately able to control the West African market. In the 1950s, as independent countries were cropping up in Africa, enterprising business people in West African nations began building printing mills, thus undermining all European factories except for the ones owned by ABC, which is uh, in Cheshire, UK, and Valisco and its African-based Ghana textile printing subsidiary, Blisco estimated in 2006 that 75% of all wax fabrics sold in Africa used its designs, but noted that their patterns were also being illegally copied by a number of Asian and African companies. Blisco's imperial approach to its African markets may be the main reason why Shonibari employs this material for his work. The company, it's very important to note this. The company does not hire African designers, producing on average about 150 new designs each year. It results in there are thousands of designs put out by Valisco. This company sends its designers, who according to the company's head of design, Franz van Rood, quote, must have a keen interest in the exotic, end of quote. Blisco's designers travel to Africa every two to three years where they talk to distributors, wholesalers, and people frequenting the marketplaces. In 2000, Van Rood characterizes the firm's product in anachronistically imperialistic terms, noting, quote, most Africans appreciate innovations that come from abroad, not those that come from within. End of quote. Van Rood has said also, quote, we interpret what we see in the African streets and we see what our imagination comes up with. End of quote. This situation this situation, I should have done this so you can see another sort of great ad from Blisco. This situation resembles the tantalizingly obtuse circularity outlined by cultural studies specialist Kobina Mercer, who asks, quote, what happens when ethnics appropriate others' appropriations of ethnicity? <laughs> End of quote. He's a smart guy. Van Rood's response is, quote, in our view, African designers are too dependent on traditions. They are craftsmen rather than artists, end of quote. I agree with you, no. <laughs> Consistent with the view that Valisco can provide African markets with an exoticism African artists do not have, the aesthetic distance to discern, its company's designers have found ways to, in quote, improve on the art of the perfect imperfection. <laughs> we hear from Van Rood again. Quote, if we use lines or rasters of lines, instead of putting them at exact geometric angles, we give the lines a slightly odd angle. Excuse me. This one. 
slightly odd angle, sometimes barely visible with the bare eye. Instead of being stable, the screen is unstable. It dances in front of your eyes." End of quote. Shonibari's use of Velisco fabrics enables him to pun the different levels a fabrication involved in the, I'm sorry, I jumped on that, involved in the creation, marketing, and the use of these textiles so that black gold is oil, Dutch wax, and hybridized African identities. Vlisko's fabrics often incorporate shorthand signs for the local narratives that take the form of letters depicted and written proverbs, pictures of rulers such as Nelson Mandela you see here, and visiting dignitaries, and I apologize for not bringing one on of Obama because they had a whole series of things when he went to Africa, as well as emblems of government authority, political parties, wealth, and status. In addition to serving as a visual verbal pun, Shonabari's African print fabric with its assumptions of constructed Africanness is already made with the built-in joke on authenticity that even the Dadaist artist Marcel Duchamp would have appreciated. African art specialist John Picton has recalled seeing West African groups of people attending political and family celebrations all dressed in the same or similar African print fabric. In his exploration of the Yoruba in London, Oyetade has noted the prevalence of these African prints during the summer and its special events, where they appeared to epitomize a connection with Yoruba land, since he and others are under the mistaken impression that the shops at Brixton, Brixton's where Shunabari buys his fabrics, have imported all of these fabrics from Nigeria. Because there is a great difference in the quality and consequent price of African print textiles that range from the least expensive screen prints to moderately priced resin resist dyed fabrics with hand blocked colors and the relatively costly wax dyed fabrics, responses to the significance of this fabric in Shonavari's art have ranged from discussions of its working class affiliations to estimations of the considerable price that per purchasing a six meter length of Lisco textiles, the length required for a traditional woman's dress and headscarf would entail. West Africans have been known to invest in the best products, best Dutch wax products, as hedges against inflation, since real Dutch wax and super wax, along with gold and diamonds, have held their value during times of financial insecurity. As an example, of the relative values separating high from low end markets, journalist Matt Steinglass in 2000 compared real Dutch wax, which then sold for about $90 for a six meter length in the country of Togo, to an Asian knockoff, which sold for one tenth of the amount. Since the average yearly Togan per capita income was then about $350, one can readily appreciate the type of luxury product Vlisco textiles represent. The differences between low and high grades stems not just from the printing techniques employed, but also is apparent in the stability of the fabric's dyes after repeated washings. As one might expect, the cheapest materials fade after one washing, while the best retain their quality after repeated use. From this discussion, we can conclude that when Shonabara uses Dutch wax or super wax for his sculptures, he's not so much mixing low and high elements, similar to the Neo Geo artist Jeff Koons, as he is employing an identifiable polyvalent sign of colonialism, nationalism, and globalism. He does this in order to reference the luxury and expense of both European imperial pow powers and colonized elites, whose combined wealth during imperialism was derived from the political trajectories that they then had set on their course and perpetuated. Considered in this way, Schoenabar's work connects the aristocratic aristocracy of Europe with the colonized wealthy class in Africa, which benefited from Western educations and international connections.
Regarding the aristocracy and their role in this work, or his work, Shonabar has pointed out, quote, I'm not moralistic about the aristocracy. I cr personally crave the trappings of wealth like anyone else. <laughs> and he does. He dresses extraordinarily well. But politically, I do question the means by which that is achieved, quotes closed. In the early 1990s, Shonabar began attaching stretched African prints to small square stretchers, and then overpainted some of them with emulsion and house paint. His conceptual grounding in feminism, which he readily acknowledges, enabled him to regard painting as a means for signifying the subject of African print fabrics as popular culture phenomena, rather than as a set of personally generated symbols. He wanted to move the art away from himself. During this period, he was intrigued with the work of the 1980s New York postmodern abstract painter, Jonathan Lasker. And Lasker cast different abstract styles. He'd have several in one work as distinct protagonists in a non-objective type of theater he was creating. Schoenabar's approach to African print fabric led to the grid-like assembly of small rectangles against an intense wall in double dutch, and note the irony of double dutch as a title, the randomly sized circles against an indigo background in Maxa, and the giant black splatter, again, I'm showing you, representing oil, which is superimposed with overlapping rondelles of African print fabric. In 19, I'm sorry, I should have put it up there. In 1995, Shonabar began using African print fabric for Victorian clothing and five undergarments and much more. In this piece, he plays on the fact that the great, that great Britain's Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, had extolled the Victorian era as a time when bedrock British values were developed and thus, and thus advocated returning to them. Shonabari has noted that this era was also the peak period of British imperialism and a time when Africa was being divvied up by various European powers, as you see in this work. In addition to constructing individual Victorian garments in African prints so they would serve as a sign for imperialism and be read by turns as European, African, and also diasporic as his cha-cha-cha uh, Latino theme clearly indicates, Shonabari also began to present his African print fabric Victorian costumes on dressmakers' dummies in How Does a Girl Like You Get to Be a Girl Like You, <laughs> which you probably have recognized, uh, comes from a very famous line from Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest. In my opinion, Shonabar's dressmaker dummies could be considered elaborate puns on the mindless acts of historical figures, dummies in other words, who were not so much active forces as unthinking participants whose hybridized lives provide ready and willing screens on which historical events are projected. Shonabar continued subscribing to this common dressmaker's model in dressing down, but only began creating his painted and sculpted headless mannequins the following year when he created Mr. and Mrs. Andrews without their heads. <laughs> Viewed in concert with the postmodern tradition that empowered MoMA's primitivism in 20th century art exhibition to reflect on the substantially different perspectives of modernist tribal spokespersons and anthropologists, Shonibari's art is predicated on the capacity of his African prints to be viewed from radically different perspectives and in terms of multiple subject positions, in other words, hybridity, depending upon whether they are contemplated by mainstream Westerners or traditional Yoruba. Yoruba, versed in their country's traditions could well view Shonabari's use of African print 
cloth as a secular updating of igungung masquerades, particularly when one considers this artist's vivid memory of seeing them in Lagos when he was growing up. Just as igungung dancers are completely hidden underneath costumes comprised of multiple layers of cloth that connect Yoruba to their ancestors' spiritual powers, which are capable of affecting the future. So Shonabari's sculptures are defined by their clothing that looks back to imperialism and forward to global networks. The assessment of African scholar John Pemberton III that, quote, it is the agungung costume, not the performance that carries the expressive weight, end of quote, of the masquerade makes one think about how Yoruba might regard Shonibara's dramatic use of African print fabrics to reposit, in terms of excessive consumption, imperialism's continued legacy. One might also reflect on how Yoruba tribe members who build shrines and marketplaces to the trickster Eshu might regard Shonibara's use of commercial fabric to symbolize the conflicted, hybridized motivations and needs characterizing imperial and global networks. Similar to Eshu, who symbolizes the impulsive and stabilizing forces of commercial transactions, and a, as a preeminent, preeminent trickster who combines lighthearted dancing with fury and unsettling sexuality with inspired moments of intimacy, similar to these characteristics of Eshu, Shonabari's sculptures bring together conflicting points of view to indicate radically different subject positions, occasions of imminent destabilizing hybridity. In consideration of the possibility of regarding Shonabari's art from a Yoruba perspective, we might conclude that his work is definitely polyvalent in the dialectical views it permits and global in terms of the different network protocols it elicits. Speaking as a self-confessed beauty hugger, Shonabari once complained, quote, and it's up here for you, I would like to add that I have found beauty one of the most radically subversive strategies to counter a Eurocentric hegemony on the use of beauty. The debates on aesthetics cannot be narrowly defined as a modernist concern. The politics of aesthetics is directly related to issues of globalization. Thank you. <laughs>